Yeah. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate the, uh, you taking your time. It's about 2.01 now. We're going to give it a couple more minutes to allow for others to log on before we begin. So please be patient with us and we'll start momentarily. All right. Hello. Welcome all to the webinar. Thanks for joining. We're going we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm Graciela Aponte Diaz from the Center for Responsible Lending. And just a quick background, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with our organization, um, but we work on fighting predatory lending issues on all kinds of issues, payday lending and mortgages and credit cards. Um, we we uh, work on research and advocacy around all of these issues, and I'm based out of the Oakland office. So I'm going to hand it over to Liana. Good afternoon. I'm Liana Molina with the California Reinvestment Coalition. CRC is a statewide membership-based organization working to build a fair and inclusive economy that meets the needs of communities of color, low-income communities, and others who have been marginalized and historically underserved. To get started this afternoon, we are going to, basically we have two goals for the webinar. One is we want to provide an overview of the key provisions of the proposed rule. We also want to share our advocacy strategy um, that we're going to through the Stop the Debt Trap campaign. Basically we want to close some of the loopholes that are in the CFPB's proposal to strengthen the final rule. So quickly, I'll go over the agenda. We're starting off with an overview of high-cost lending in California. Then Graciela is going to discuss the urgent opportunity ahead with the CFPB rule. She's going to review some of the key elements of the current proposal. And then I will discuss some, strat some techniques for submitting the CFPB comment letter, so how to actually think about writing a letter. We will have an opportunity for questions and answers of the next steps at the end. 
And before I transition to Graciela between um, the overview and the CFPB discussion, we will pause to take any clarifying questions around uh, just the status of, of this, these practices in our state. The other thing to note is that if questions come up for you while we're speaking, please feel free to type them into the chat box that is on the right-hand side of the screen. Also, there are a few handouts that are attached to this presentation. You should be able to download and review those as we're, as we're speaking if you would like to. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. So high-cost lending in California, we'll, we'll start with the payday loans. Payday loans are short-term, high-cost, small-dollar loans that are expected to be paid back in one lump sum by the borrower's next payday, which is typically two weeks. There are two types of payday loans, those that can be found in a storefront and those that are available online. Banks previously used to make payday loans but discontinued the practice uh, about a year and a half ago after the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the FDIC issued guidance on deposit-related advances. So in our state, these are also called deferred deposit transactions, which are authorized under the California Deferred Deposit Transaction Law. The legal maximum, uh, the legal payday loan maximum is $300, including a $45 fee. Consumers borrow $255 after the $45 fee is withheld, and the average APR on a two-week $300 loan is about 460%. The majority of storefront lenders in California charge the maximum fee, and the major problem with payday loans is that the loan is structured in such a way that it traps most borrowers in a cycle of debt, because these loans are made without regard to affordability. As you can see, the borrowers only need uh, a few things to obtain these loans, which include an ID, checking account information, proof of income, and they do not take into account the borrower's budget, debts, and expenses. Uh, a couple more stats. In, in our state, there's about close to 2 million borrowers, and most folks are taking out about 7 to 10 loans in a year. Moving on to the higher cost car title and installment loans. So these loans are actually permitted under the California Finance Lenders Law. With a car title loan, a borrower is pledging their car title essentially as security for a high interest loan, which is typically going to be greater than $2,500 and come with about a two to three year contract. In 2014, 95% of car title loans carried APRs that exceeded 70%, and over half of these lenders charged rates that were higher than 100% APR. We know that this is the fastest growing segment of, small, of the small dollar loan market in our state, which tripled between 2011 and 2014. The DBO, the Department of Business Oversight, released a report recently which found that there were nearly 17,000 repossessions last year alone. Another, another type of loan that is made under the California Finance Lenders Law, or the CFLL, we call them payday loans on steroids. They're actually high-cost installment loans. And these loans are typically longer term. They can be paid off uh, over a few months or more likely a few years. The idea is that they're paid off in equal installments. However, it is very difficult because of the high cost for borrowers to pay down the principal of the loan. An important thing to note about the CFL is that currently there are no interest rate restrictions for loans that are above $2,500. So what we're seeing is a growth of lenders. Some of them are payday lenders, most of them, who are now making more car title and installment loans in the range of about $2,600 to about $5,000. And again, over half of these loans carry APRs that are above 100%, uh, sometimes exceeding 200%. So this is a growing problem in our state. In terms of the impacts on California consumers, there are several things that we would like to highlight. One is the cycle of debt or the debt trap, right? It's the repeat borrowing. Uh, we know from several studies, but one that I'll share would be the 2013 Pew report, that the average payday loan borrower can afford to pay back only $50 after their regular expenses. 
and only 14% of borrowers can afford to repay the full loan amount out of their monthly budget. According to a report put out by the Department of Business Oversight here in California earlier this month, payday loan borrowers with 10 loans outnumbered borrowers with only one loan by about 43%. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in their research found that four out of five payday loans, or 80%, are rolled over or reborrowed within 30 days. Finally, um, with regard to overdraft fees, account closures, the fee, dra um, and the fee drain, excuse me, uh, CRL found recently that consumers pay a total of $500 million in payday loan fees and almost $240 million in car title fees here in California. So essentially, Californians are paying almost $750 million in fees, which are drained from the pockets of hardworking families throughout our state contributing to an asset stripping, impeding uh, people's ability to save, and stripping their income. So this picture here are, is a photo of consumers that we have been working with over the course of the last year. They came together for the California Consumer Justice uh, Leadership Academy in Los Angeles. And these folks, um, so each one of these women here had very compelling personal stories of how they got stuck in a high-cost loan. Some of them were payday loans, some of them were installment loans, and some of them were car title loans. Each one of these women paid out hundreds or even thousands of dollars in fees throughout the course of their experience. One participant, Joanne Taylor, who is standing in the way back, uh, she took out an online loan for $3,000 and was paying almost $600 a month back in a repayment. It was a severe financial burden that led to almost $200, uh, excuse me, to almost $250 in overdraft fees, which ultimately resulted in having her bank account closed. Through that period, she also fell behind on her bills and her rent, and she ultimately ended up homeless. She had to move in with her daughter. And even after paying off $4,000 uh, to the company, uh, she still ended up defaulting on the loan. They wanted her to pay, I believe it was somewhere around seven or $8,000. So we told Joanne's story last spring at a Senate hearing on the proposed CFPB rule. Uh, and the lender happened to be present at that hearing. So we were able to connect Joanne with the lender and work with the lender so that they, quote unquote, forgave the rest of her debt and uh, did not pursue a co collection effort. So I just wanted to share that as a very unique story. Well, unique in the sense that ultimately the lender was able to work with her and ensure that it wasn't going to adversely affect her credit. But of course, there are millions of borrowers throughout the state that don't have the opportunity, that never connect with our agencies. So we know that these consumers deserve better. And that's precisely why we're all on this webinar, so that we can weigh in and ensure that the CFPB is going to uh, finalize the strongest rule that they can. So quickly, just in terms of what we've been advocating for over the last several years in terms of our consumer protection policy reform goals relative to these small dollar loans, first and foremost, we would like to pass an interest rate cap that would be required either through state or federal legislation. Specifically, we're looking at an, an APR cap of 36% or less. 14 states, including the state of New York, as well as the District of Columbia, currently have interest rate caps that are 36% or less. In these states, payday lending is really not allowed. Uh, Congress and the Department of Defense also took action to protect military service personnel, active duty, um, as well as their dependents through the Military Lending Act which prevents loans with APRs from uh, higher than 36% for active duty uh, military members. So we know that this is something that does actually protect consumers from the debt trap, and this is something that we would like to ultimately win over the long term. What, the opportunity that's available to us today is through the CFPB rulemaking process. And unfortunately, the CFPB does not have the authority to implement a rate cap. However, they can do a few reforms. They can make a few reforms that would be very important in helping to protect consumers, including implementing an ability to repay requirement, where lenders would have to verify a, a consumer's ability to repay the loan, not only looking at their income, but also their expenses. 
They can also implement protections against loan flipping and abusive collection practices, which we'll be talking about uh, more momentarily. So we're going to pause here to see if anyone has questions. If you do, I believe that you can type them in the chat box, and we'll hold on for a few minutes. So if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box, and we can also unmute. We'll unmute and if anyone. Okay, hearing no questions, we will go ahead and move on to the second portion. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay, I think we are good now. So um, we're going to jump into the next portion here. There we go. Okay, so um, so I'm going to jump into this urgent opportunity that Liana has, has pointed out to us. Um, it's before us. The CSPB has proposed a rule. And um, I'm going to walk us through this timeline just so you guys can see what, what led us to this rule and to this, uh, to this deadline that we've got coming up. So, um, so first of all, starting just going back to 2009 when Elizabeth Warren kind of thought of this new idea of a federal agency that can protect consumers. Um, there, there were various uh, agencies already, the OCC, OTS, Federal Reserve, all had um, authority around regulating lenders but none with the sole purpose of protecting consumers. And so that's the idea behind the, the CFPB. And that amazing idea got included into the Financial Reform Bill, Dodd-Frank. And that, uh, getting that bill through Congress was a David and Goliath fight against the industry. They put millions of dollars into lobbying against this bill, but consumer advocates came together and really um, pulled through and we were able to, to get that bill moved forward and, and there was uh, the CFPB was created. So we got this new federal agency. It opened its doors in 2011. In fact, I think tomorrow is their five-year anniversary. Um, the CFPB is able to do research, write national rules, enforce their rules as well as existing laws. And so they're, they're tasked with writing rules on different pieces, like mortgages and credit cards. And payday lending, it, it's our turn right now for a payday rule. So that's why it's so important for us to weigh in right now, because they are going to keep on going and writing rules on, on other issues. Um, but they have, between 2012 and 2016, really dug into this issue of payday lending, car title lending, and installment lending. They've done research, enforcement actions, they've come to the community, done field hearings. I'm sure many of you have joined some of their field hearings. And um, they, they had a previous rule that they issued about a year ago, and uh, a lot of folks weighed in with public comments. It was really um, just sort of a starting point. I wanted to see how it impacted small business, uh, the small businesses. And um, as of last month, June 2nd, uh, they issued an official proposed payday rule that is open to public comment. So we've got 90 days uh, starting on June 2nd to submit public comment. And, th and that deadline is uh, fast approaching September 14th. And so once that window closes, they'll go back and write the final rule, which um, we hope to come out sometime in 2017, um, but it could be pushed, you know, as far as 2018. Um, so that's sort of the timeline up to, you know, what, how we can weigh into this rule. Um, we, we're really hoping to get as many public comments as possible. We've heard that the industry has this goal of 100,000 public comment letters. 
So this will be another sort of David and Goliath site for us to, to make sure we have enough comments submitted in there. And there's two main reasons why we want to gather your comment letters. Um, number one, your comments are really going to shape the final rule. Um, as we walk through what this rule looks like, what the strengths are and what the weaknesses are, we, we really want you to kind of think about how does this impact your community um, and, and, if, and writing, in writing your letters, really telling the story of, of the impact on your clients. And that could really help shape uh, if this is a really strong rule at the end of the day or something that the lenders can keep, um, keep lending at the high cost that they are lending at right now. Uh, the second reason that it's really important is that um, if any legal challenges come up to the rule, this will be the public comment will be evidence that it was very important to have a strong rule, um, and that's why the CFPB moved forward on it. So we we are pretty sure that there will be legal challenges. Um, so those are two of the main reasons we're on here, and we're going to walk you through this rule, and and really hope that you can um, craft a comment letter to help shape this shape this rule. Okay, so jumping in, I'm, I'm going to start with what the CFPB's goals were with the rule. So they really wanted um, to, to, um, to address these three buckets. So ability to repay, making sure that a borrower um, can pay the loan back as well as pay all of their other debts and basic living expenses and not need to reborrow another loan. That's, that's the, their primary goal, our, our primary goal as well. Um, debt trap protections, they want to uh, make sure that, they're, that borrowers are not getting caught up in borrowing and reborrowing this long-term cycle of debt. And, uh, and the last goal being payment protections. So uh, all, these lenders have access to your bank account. They also can have access to... Um, Oh, sorry, not the, sorry, I was going to go into the card title, but just focusing on the bank account, um, they can uh, access their loan payments, and even if you don't have the money in your account, they can draw and overdraw your account, and you're hit with overdraft fees, so we want to make sure that, um, that we're protecting folks from that. Sorry, my screen saver. <laughs> Technical difficulties, one second. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. Okay, one second. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, so base and, and before I jump into the rest of the rule, I just want to say that overall, um, we're 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 happy with the approach that that the CFPB has taken on looking at the ability to repay, but there are some major loopholes that we're going to walk through that we think are very important to be closed in order to provide the protections that are needed. So, um, so with that lens, we will jump into uh, the rule. So what is covered? Loans that are covered, payday loans, car title loans, certain high-cost installment loans, as Liana mentioned, that's a lot. Uh, California uh, payday borrowers are moving more into the installment space here in California, um, and then certain open-end line of credit and other loans. So uh, the way the CFPB has defined this is they've put it into two buckets of short-term loans and long-term loans. So short-term loans are going to be those that are 45 days or less, such as payday loans, and long-term loans um, they have three criteria. So the first one being that they're longer than 45 days, such as an installment or a car title loan. Uh, the second criteria is that they have an APR greater than 36%, and that includes any origination fees or other fees that are charged by a lender, um, so what we call an all-in, all-in uh, inclusive 36% APR. And the third criteria, um, which is very common for these loans, is that it's secured with either a post-dated check from a borrower's bank account or um, an electronic debit authorization from uh, the borrower's bank account, or they take possession of your car title. So if any of those things happen within 72 hours of the loan being dispersed, um, and you hit all those three criteria, then you will be covered under the CFPB rule. 
Um, so just uh, one more thing on this piece. We think that we're, we're supportive of, of the broad approach that they've taken with what loans are going to be covered. We are concerned that there is an exclusion for credit cards. We think the Military Lending Act did a, a better job of um, the exemption for, for credit cards, um, so we think that that can be strengthened. There's also an exclusion for loans that are secured by personal property um, and, those, and those that garnish wages. So those two, we think, should be included here. Um, we know that lenders can be sort of aggressive and they're trying to, to recoup their loan payments and if they can you know, use the threat of personal property securing your loan or that they can garnish wages, we think that can be pretty scary to, to borrowers and something that um, uh, they can really coerce payments out of folks even if they don't have the funding, the, the money to pay. Okay. So um, jumping into the first bucket that I mentioned, ability to repay. So in general, you've got to, um, um, sorry, income and expenses must be verified. So those expenses include like your housing costs, your rental costs, or your mortgage. Um, it can also include anything that's on your credit report. And basic living expenses can be forecasted. So w we think the definition um, that's laid out is the right one, where the borrower has the ability to repay and continue making their, their financial obligations and living expenses without reborrowing. Um, so that's great. However, however the, the big loophole is that lenders can actually make six exemption loans before they even have to use uh, the ability to repay standards. So they don't have to do any underwriting for six exemption loans. Um, we think that's a major loophole. We think all loans should have to be subject to ability to repay. Uh, one unaffordable loan can spiral someone into a cycle of debt. Um, so uh, number two, when a lender is forecasting basic living expenses, uh, they can use a lender default reborrowing and refinancing as evidence that they are assessing a borrower's ability to repay. So they can say that their defaults and reborrowing and refinancing rates are no worse than other lenders. So that's the business as usual loophole that we've um, that we're fighting against. And number three, um, a, we meant I mentioned this before that the loan is not covered if the lender doesn't get access to a bank account. Um, or a car title 72 hours um, after the disbursement. So what, we, what could play out here is that a lender could disperse the loan, wait out the 72 hours, and then call a borrower and say, hey, you know, we need your bank account information um, or, or something like that. So we think that at any point in time during your loan, if, if the lender asks for um, your bank account information or your car title, that they should be subject to the to the standard as well, to the rule. Uh, so the second bucket, the debt trap protection. So this is limiting, you know, how many loans can be flipped. Um, so again, it, at this point, you know, you're already allowed to do six exemption loans. Um, we think that's that's too many, but uh, each the way it works is for the exemption loans that if you ask for a loan within 30 days of the first, that subsequent loan has to be can can be no more than two thirds of the first loan, and then similar the third loan um, is going to be one third less of the principal amount. So they're going down um, the principal balance that you can ask for has to be reduced. After the third loan, you've got a 30-day cooling off period, and then you can start again and do another three loans in that similar sequence. So uh, one, one major thing that we noticed is that the CFPB had previously proposed a 60-day cooling off period between loans, um, and they have reduced that in this rule to 30 days. And so we are pushing for that to, to go back to the 60-day cooling off period to make sure folks are not stuck into, stuck into a cycle of debt. Um, the other thing that I'll point out, and Liana will talk about uh, towards the end and what you should include in your comment letters, is that there is a 90-day limit of indebtedness for these loans. 
so you can't be in debt for, for more than 90 days. But um, for other loans that are underwritten that do use ability to repay, there is no 90-day indebted rule. So we're pushing for that to be um, included for all loans. Okay, so uh, the next piece, of, and, and I'm sorry, one more thing on, on this piece. These are the um, weaknesses and loopholes for the short-term loans. For the long-term loans, there's actually um, there there are actually different exemptions, and there's there's limited exemptions on how many times they can flip those loans. So we don't think that you should be able to flip a, a long-term loan more than once. And um, so there's there's some major issues around the flipping around the long-term long-term loan space. Uh, payment protection. So we talked about um, how lenders have access to your bank account. And so this is, uh, right now what the rule says is that if the lender goes into your bank account and there's two failed attempts to collect the loan payment, that they then have to go back to the borrower and ask for a new authorization. And so uh, we think that that is too many times. One failed attempt means that that person does not have the money to pay that loan or is using that money for you know other living expenses. So we think that uh, after one failed attempt, they should have to go back to the borrower and ask for um, permission again for access to their bank account. Um, this loophole, I'm laughing because of the title, uh, <laughs> but this loophole we are very excited was closed from the previous version. So the um, previous version that I mentioned was issued a year ago, included an exemption, um, we'll, just, we'll call it the 5% payment to income exemption. And what that means is that if a, if a, a borrower's gross income, uh, if, if the loan payment is 5% less than their gross income, then that's the standard to, to, to for a lender to say they can afford to make that loan payment. So they didn't, so the lender in that case would not have to do any underwriting um, in checking for uh, verifying income and expenses. They just have to see that the loan payment is 5% less uh, than, 5% of your gross income. So um, we are very happy that that exemption has been removed and we hope that it is not included again, so we're hoping that you guys can write to to that point to make sure that um, income and expenses are verified. Um, so uh, CF, the CFPB in June issued a study that showed that default that for payment installment loans, um, 28 to 40 percent of them were defaulting um, in where the gross of the payment was five percent less than the income of the borrower. So they, they did look at a category of folks that were in that um, 5% and they had extremely high default rates. And so we believe that's why they have um, eliminated that exemption. Uh, some, some folks are defending the exclusion, saying that it's necessary for banks to make loans. Uh, we don't believe that banks need a special path to make reasonably priced loans. Um, we're also afraid that unscrupulous lenders will try to exploit the exemption, making triple-digit interest rate loans and justifying them as being 5% of a borrower's income or less. Um, and finally, we think this exemption would threaten strong state laws. Lenders could urge state legislators to weaken their laws, including where loans are capped at 36% APR, and say that they're keeping loans safe, um, as the CFPB has indicated. So there, we have a, I think it's a one or two pager that explains this a little bit more. Um, we, we just want to make sure that you guys really understand that and include that in your comments to say, um, yay CSPB for uh, closing that loophole and please don't put it back. All right, so stay with us everybody. We're almost toward the end. We are entering the last segment of this webinar where we're talking about how we actually put together a CFPB comment letter. So Graciela talked about this earlier, uh, but just to reiterate that we have an opportunity to shape what the final rule looks like. 
and you all especially kind of know what the needs of our communities are from your work day to day out in the field, serving clients, uh, um, helping clients deal with some of these issues after the fact. So we know what our what the solutions are, and we're the uh, the experts that can help inform what the regulators are doing. Uh, another thing we wanted to to underscore is that personalized kind of unique letters are way more powerful than form letters. So while we're going to provide a sample, we're really encouraging you all to, to write about what you know, what you're seeing, what your agency perspectives are, um, to share that with the CFPB, um, which you are welcome to take information from the various resources that we'll provide, as well as the sample letter. But we, we definitely want folks to spend time, since we do have about eight weeks till the deadline um, to write out, you know, some some thoughtful uh, comments. And then finally, I also wanted to reiterate that these comments and the input that we're giving the CFPB is helping the CFPB build a strong public record that they can then stand on to defend the rule um, in the end, which you know is likely to be challenged. So the more that we can generate comments, the more that we can encourage uh, clients and and you know, others to submit complaints, that's all helping the CFPB do their job. And, you know, it'll help them defend against any attacks later on. So with that, we're going to talk about the actual comment letters. So first and foremost, we're encouraging you all to make these comments on behalf of your agencies. So part of that would be including the final comment on organizational letterhead. Right? We also want you all to customize the letters by referencing your organization or your particular service areas um, throughout the letter as, as you know, you're writing it. Um, just general you know, etiquette around letter writing. You know, include the date. Um, include the, the name of your reader so you'll see the address for Director Cordring. We're going to give you this information, so don't worry about capturing it. Um, with regard to specific uh, requests for public comments, we want to notify them that you know your organization, you'll fill, fill in the blank there, is submitting comments on the proposed rulemaking on payday, vehicle title, and certain high-cost installment loans. And it's really important to include the docket number that you see here, which again will be available on the materials. So with regard to writing the comment letter, what we wanted to do here was just talk through the content. Um, to give you a sense of, of what to think about and what to include in this. So in your first paragraph, you know, of course, and this is, you know, you all have written letters for other purposes. Um, so the general, you know, the general approach around stating the reason you're writing and what it is that you want the reader, in this case the CFPB regulator, um, to do for you, for your clients, for your community, for those that have fallen, um, you know, fallen into these high-cost debt traps, right? Uh, secondly, we want you to spend some time introducing your organization. So in that, you know, talk about your mission, talk about your programs, anything related to the financial capacity, financial literacy, financial coaching, uh, you know, providing uh, services to folks that are in debt collection, you know, the range of what you do, even if you're building affordable housing. I mean, there are a number of connections to, you know, how you all are trying to improve the quality of life for those in, in the communities that you serve. Um, touch on the size of your agency or the size of the populations that you serve, you know, the location, your service areas, um, and, and, you know, who are, who are your clients? Who are the populations? Or what is the community, the constituency that, that your agency seeks to uplift? Um, so once you kind of get some of those basics out of the way around your purpose and and your introduction and who you are, we do want you all to spend some time talking about how this issue impacts, um, again, either clients or the communities that you serve. So if possible, if you're able to identify a client story, uh, someone that you've worked with that has been high, harmed by high cost, either payday, car title, or installment, it would be great to Share, the, share that in your comment letter. If you don't see clients, then you can just discuss how these high-cost lending practices undermine the work that you're trying to do, right, to improve your community and to improve access um, to housing, to financial opportunities, to whatever the, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, as you all know, there's a wealth of literature and research and data points out there 
So we'll provide a number of those for you to pick and choose what kind of facts you want to use to support your, your ask. Um, but we definitely encourage you to kind of take some of those factoids and include that as part of, of you know, what you're writing in these letters. Um, essentially, you want to share the most compelling reasons for the CFPB to take action and to finalize a strong rule. Um, so as you start moving toward concluding your letter, you know, again, you want to talk about what the CFP, what we want the CFPB to do. So everything that Graciela just went through would be some of the messages and some of the pieces to include in the letter, right? So this is kind of our, our shared campaign message. So with that, oh, sorry, I'm going to move on. So with that, um, for example, our policy ask around ability to repay, um, including income and expenses, and our main a uh, message there is that we don't want to see any exemptions to that requirement, right? That that should apply across the board to all lenders. Um, you know, the broad message around closing some of the loopholes that Graciela discussed. Um, so in particular, you know, we want to ensure, for example, that there is a total of a 90-day limit to indebtedness, particularly for the short-term loans which would mean that, you know, someone would not be allowed to take out more than six a year or three if they're for a 30-day term. So that would be one, uh, one particular change, you know, what we would want to see specified in the rule. Um, we would also like to strengthen the anti-loan slipping protections as well as the payment protections. So, to, you know, to tease that a little bit more, um, requiring the reauthorization to access payment after one failed attempt versus two. Um, and also, in terms of the long-term loans, you know, the, the overall protections need to be stronger. Um, the rule does not do enough. So, for example, refinancing of long-term loans should not be allowed more than once. So that's one example. So basically, spend some time, you know, naming a couple of of these specific policy points that we would like to see addressed in the final rule. And then as you close out, you know, of course, thank the CFPB for considering our comments. If you'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the, the positivity around, you know, the core principle of ability to repay or eliminating the 5%, uh, uh, you know, previous proposal, um, and then provide your contact information. And we, are, again, are encouraging folks to conclude the letter comments we're getting from California groups. Um, with regard to the resources and materials available, so we did include a handout on this webinar, a summary of the CSPB proposal, which is from the We have a couple of fact sheets, and, and we will make, you know, the ver various research reports available to you, and of course, you know, we'd like to offer ourselves as a resource to you, Graciela, myself, uh, Benny Tinson down in LA. Um, we're very happy to assist you all in thinking through and, and drafting these comments. And if there's anything else that would be helpful, you know, please let us know. So in terms of next steps, before we move on to questions and answers and, you know, any discussion that we want to have, um, we're asking you all to please think of one ally organization that you could ask to write a comment letter so that we can magnify our, or excuse me, amplify our impact. Additionally, we're encouraging folks to individually sign on to an online petition, which is available at .paydaypredators.org. Um, you can also visit our unique landing pages at backslash calreinvest or backslash California CRL. And then finally, um, I think many of you know we are engaged in advocacy efforts to build political support amongst our congressional representatives. So be on the lookout for opportunities 
uh, to, 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 do, to take part in that. Um, we do expect Congresswoman Maxine Waters from LA to author a House sign-on letter, and that should be available very soon. So we'll be asking you all to contact your representative to encourage them to, to sign on to that. So with that, uh, concludes our formal webinar presentation, and now we want to open it up if folks have questions, comments, um, concerns, anything that you want to share. And I believe that we are going to unmute everyone. So if you have a noise, if you're in a noisy place, please mute yourself. Okay, hi. I believe folks are unmuted now. Yeah, so we just want to open it up to any questions or comments if you have any about the information that's been presented or the letter. And I guess let's pull up the um, handout. We're, we're, we're going to pull up the handout as well so you can take a look at the sample letter. Do they give classes on student loans and reconsolidation? No, but I saw it. Yeah. Um, I was hoping so. to yeah. okay. so I've, I've got this on screen now. This All right. Now. Okay. So to, to just take a look at the sample letter. So this actually is very text heavy. Um, and we wanted to share this so that you could see an example. Um, however, we are discouraging you from just cutting and pasting this on your uh, letterhead simply because, you know, we don't want to generate a bunch of form letters. We really want them to be, you know, unique letters given, agent, you know, unique individual agency perspectives. But you are welcome to take this and, you know, tweak it in whichever ways you see necessary. I mean, keep, you can keep some portions of it. So do folks have any questions? I'm driving. We have your names. We can call on you, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, if folks don't have any questions, then what we will do is, you know, make sure that these supplemental handouts are available to you, and we will be following up with folks to confirm your intent to submit a letter, to kind of check in on the progress of drafting it, to figure out if there are other agencies that you can help reach out to, to get them to write letters, all of that stuff. So yeah, we're about 10 till 3, so folks don't have any questions. I know that was a lot of info. Um, just, just to make sure you guys can... Um, I, I am going to pick on someone. Wendy, are you there? I see you on the um, <coughs> back end. I, w I wanted to know if you wanted to share anything from uh, the fly-in event or the, the work that you guys have been doing at LULAC. Hi, Graciela. Yes, I'm here. Um, so with LULAC, we are currently working with our local councils. Um, what we're starting to do is we're meeting with both of them and presenting to our councils on the rule on how to lend the effects of community and our LULAC members. And we're encouraging them to submit comments and also work their own networks within their community to submit those comments. And they're usually, um, they're currently doing the online portal. Um, so that's what we're working on right now. OK, that's awesome. And and I know you guys did a lot of work at your conference. I heard there was 
shark costume walking around the conference collecting comment letters. And so thank you for your work on that. Yeah, we tried to do a little bit of a national effort at our convention. And then here in California, we're doing a big focus on that as well. Awesome. Um, I'm going to pick on another person because I see your name. <laughs> um, Oh, there's some questions. In the chat box. Oh, okay. sorry. We may we might have been ignoring questions in the chat box. we looking. Nope. Can you see that? Um, okay. So I'm gonna pick on Rosie from New. Rosie, are you still there? All right. I won't pick on more people. Any other questions before? Any questions? Can we take questions there? Oh, are there questions? Sorry. Here, I'm going to get a question. No, I think we're good. All right. So, all right. Well, hearing none, uh, Graciela and I, our contact information is available. We we have a list of everyone who logged on, so we'll make sure that you get the handouts and a copy of this presentation. We may hold another webinar for those who couldn't be on today, so we'll keep folks posted on that so that you can share with colleagues and encourage others to participate. Otherwise, we're really happy that you all were able to join us. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your willingness to advocate and to get these letters in. And we will be following up with you very soon. And if you're in Oakland, uh, come to the town hall on Friday at 11 in City Hall. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Well, that's, that's not Thank <laughs> you.